When the moon hangs high in the midnight sky Like a cat's claw scratching down And the wolves, they do howl For they smell something foul Mr. Whiskers has come to town He trundles out of the dark Looking for a lark You better pray you don't catch his eye For when he is done having his fun You just might wish you could die <laughs> Welcome, welcome. Sit yourself down by the fire. I know it's a touch early in the season for camping, but what can I say? The weather has been pleasant, and the stars are those shining beacons of light that distract us from the vastness of the void that contains them are especially bright tonight. Oh, how rude of me. I'm your host, and I've yet to introduce myself. I'm Mr. Whiskers, the Mad Catter. And no, I'm not angry. Think of it as something of a little title of sorts. Oh, here, have a mug. It's a hot spiced wine, and, and sure, it's not the holidays, but it is damned fine to have on a crisp spring night like this. Don't you think? Hmm. You know another fine thing? Stories. In fact, since you're here, you might as well sit back and relax and have yourself a listen. I have a nice selection here. Let me think. Ah! For our first story, I think it's best to start off simple. This is a delightful tale reminiscent of certain urban legends and fairy tales. It's about a young man who is quite skeptical when his... Mm, jokester of a friend texts him to tell him... I'm downstairs. I'm downstairs. By Matthew Stacks. The clock struck midnight. I was on my laptop in my bedroom, browsing through YouTube videos. However, my browsing stopped when my phone vibrated. I saw that I received a text message from my friend Ben. Hey man, I'm outside by the back door. Can you let me in? I knew he was lying. For the last few weekends, he had been messing with me. One weekend, he told me he was parked in my cul-de-sac when in reality he was in his bedroom. The following weekend, he told me he was coming over to hang out. When I came outside to greet him in his car, he floored it out of my neighborhood. I wasn't going to let him get me this time. I sent a reply back. I know you're just messing with me again. He immediately replied back. No, I'm serious this time. I am by the back door. Nice try. I know you're not there. I placed my phone down and continued my search. About a minute later, my phone vibrated again. I'm downstairs. Ben, you can't troll me three weeks in a row. However, I'll give you an A for effort. I placed my phone down again. I wasn't going to play his little game. As I was about to continue my search, I started to hear something from the deafening silence of my dark house. I faced the doorway behind me and listened closely. It sounded like footsteps. Silent footsteps walking around downstairs. It was nerve-wracking. I couldn't believe it. Was my mind tricking me, or was Ben actually in my house? I grabbed my phone. Are you joking with me, man? 
I continued to listen as my phone vibrated again. No, I told you I was downstairs, but you didn't believe me. I was quite relieved that it was him, but I was pissed off that he broke into my house. I could still hear him walking around downstairs as I waited for him to come into my bedroom. I grabbed my phone again. Aren't you going to come upstairs? I can hear you walking around downstairs. Just come up here already. I sent the message and waited for him to respond. I was starting to get a little annoyed after a minute of waiting. I got up from my bed and went to the doorway. I proceeded to shout downstairs. Get your ass upstairs already! Stop fucking around! I sat back on my bed as I began to hear him walk upstairs. Suddenly, my phone vibrated again. It was a text message from Ben. You know I was fucking with you, right? My heart dropped. I looked up at the doorway to see my killer smiling at me. Now, wasn't that positively a classic? I swear it's like the boy who cried wolf for the modern age. <laughs> Ah, for our next story, well, have you ever been a bit nervous to open the blinds? Or, or, or felt trepidation at pulling back the curtains? Have you ever sat at home watching TV and had the inexplicable feeling that there was someone watching you? That if you just pulled back the curtains or lifted the blinds, you might see the man in the window. The Man in the Window Author Unlisted Things had been tough for my mom and I, ever since Dad left us two years ago. At least I was old enough to get myself to and from school, and I knew my way around a microwave. But I wasn't old enough to get a job, and the bills were piling up. My mom decided to get a second job. A night job. Maybe part-time and not something to brag about, but it would keep our heads above water. I remember the first night like it was yesterday. My mom apologizing up and down for having to leave me alone. I told her I'd be fine, and honestly, I was pretty excited. She wouldn't be home until late, and that meant I could stay up late. There was a monster movie marathon on, so who would complain? It was just around 9.30, and I was right in the thick of some Japanese gore fest when I swore I heard something outside. Maybe it was my mind playing tricks on me, Maybe the movie got to me. Either way, I had to check it out. I hesitantly peered out of the living room window, looking to the left, then the right, and nothing. Then I noticed, directly across the way, a man standing in his window, just staring. I couldn't really tell what he was staring at, but it freaked me out anyway. I stood at the window for at least a minute, as long as my heart could bear it, and he didn't move. That was it for me that night. I was done with the monster flicks, done with the freaky dude in the window, and tried to fall asleep. The next morning, I told my mom about the man. First, she was upset I was up so late, and then she asked if I'd been watching any scary movies. Needless to say, I got the whole, it was all in my imagination thing, and that was that. That night, after my mom left, I didn't feel comfortable alone. It was like that feeling of someone watching you, and just after nine again, I swear I heard something. 
It was just like the last, except there was no horror movie marathon. Against what my brain was screaming at me, I pulled myself again to the window. There he was. The man just staring out of his window. This time I darted away as quick as I could and ran to my room. It was so weird. It got the hair on my neck standing on end. The next morning I told my mom, but she just brushed it off, saying he was probably just a nervous old man and it had nothing to do with me. I wasn't so sure, but what could I do? My mom left for work that night, even though I begged her to stay. I tried to take my mind off the man. I watched TV. I played music. I even did all my homework. But still I wondered if he was out there, staring from his window at me or God knows what. My curiosity got the better of me, and I made my way to the window. My fear was realized in that moment because there he was, the man in the window, just staring. I tried to keep my presence a secret and see just how long he would stand there. My heart felt like it was going to leap out of my chest. But I stayed there at the window, in some sort of weird staring contest. Then it happened. He moved away from the window, and I breathed a sigh of relief. My mom was right. I was worried about nothing. Suddenly, his front door opened, and my comfort changed to dread in an instant. I watched from my window trying my best not to be seen, watching him walk down his driveway, then across the street, then up my driveway. I choked in fear and ran for the telephone. I dialed 911 and waited, my heart jackhammering a million miles an hour. Finally an answer. I explained to the lady that I thought someone was trying to break in my house, and she said help would be on the way and asked for my address. I managed to get out the first three numbers when I was grabbed from behind. I dropped the phone and felt these dirty, greasy hands wrap themselves around me. I screamed as loud as I could and shook myself, trying to break free, but I was lifted from the ground. I could feel the hot breath on my neck, smell the stale, rotten stench of my attacker. I couldn't help but start crying, screaming my lungs out for my mom, for anyone to help. Then there was a thud, and I was falling with the man towards the floor. We hit, and his grip loosened. I rolled away and scrambled behind the couch. Then I, then I heard a voice say, It's okay. You're safe now. I looked up, shaking and bewildered. There were two men, one on the floor who wasn't moving, and another standing there with a baseball bat. You're okay, he said again. I'm your neighbor from across the way. My jaw dropped in confusion. I have noticed a strange man looking around your house every night for the last few days and was concerned you might be in danger. I noticed your mom leaving and knew you were here all by yourself. The police arrived shortly afterwards, and between our two stories, the mysterious assailant was taken into custody. I thanked my neighbor as much as I could, and from that day... I always felt safer when I looked outside and saw the man in the window across from me. Ah, classic case of a nosy neighbor coming to the rescue. Though I do find it a touch odd that the young lad still opens his blinds and looks out the window to see the man across the street watching his house. But who am I to judge? Ah, 
Now, one of my favorite tropes when it comes to horror stories is when something normally mundane becomes something positively dreadful. Whether it's shopping at a mall you can never seem to find the exit to, or maybe a haunted house on Halloween where you find the corpses are surprisingly realistic. Or in this case, about a boy getting picked up by the bus. The Bus, the bus. By, by Fight of Toro. 1975, my best friend disappeared. I'm going to tell you what happened. It won't take long, because the story is a short one. But that's a necessity of the facts. Quite simply, there aren't many. Here they are. His name was James Wade. He was 13 years old. One night, he went to bed, and the next morning, he wasn't there. The front door was open, and James was gone. The house, as far as anyone could tell, hadn't been broken into, and there were no signs of a disturbance. James wasn't a troubled child, and his parents were decent, loving, and hardworking. They all lived together in a nice, middle-class neighborhood in the suburbs. No one ever saw him again. The police had no leads, no clues, and no suspects. The story pretty much starts and ends there. Pretty much. But not quite. James disappeared on a Wednesday night. I saw him in school earlier that day, and he told me that, the previous night, something had woken him up in the early hours of the morning. Exactly what, he couldn't say. It was late November, and when he'd gone to bed, the wind had been shrieking with a vengeance, but when he woke up, everything was deathly still. Maybe the sudden quiet woke him. Sleep is strange like that. <sighs> Whatever. When he did wake, he woke with a crawling sense of dread. Like he'd just surfaced from a nightmare, and as he lay there with his heart pounding in his chest and the silence pounding in his ears, he heard something. Faint at first. The low, heavy growl of a big diesel engine, somewhere close and getting closer. Then, as it approached his house, he heard a second noise. It took him a moment to realize it was a horn, beeping gently, like someone taking care not to wake the whole street, tapping out a friendly rhythm, a kind of toot uh, toot toot toot. But it was a horrible noise, James said, tortured and unnatural, like the honking of a dying goose. He crept to the window and looked outside, crawling down the empty street at the unhurried pace of an ice cream van was an old school bus, a battered yellow GMC. One of those things that looks like a cross between a tractor and a horse box. It looked like it had driven through a swamp. There were mud splatters radiating out from the rusted wheel arches, and dead leaves rotting in the windscreen grill. The windows were streaked with grime. At least one of them was cracked. Some of the body panels had been replaced and the bodywork was a patchwork of yellow shades, adorned with black lettering that was peeling away, hanging off the sides of the bus like shreds of torn skin. James didn't switch on the bedroom light, and he didn't open the curtains. He just kind of peered through a crack between the drapes. 
But when he did this, the bus rolled to a stop. It stood there for a few moments, idling in the center of the road. Then the headlights flashed. By now, James's skin was crawling in terror. Seeing an old school bus on a quiet residential back street in the early hours of the morning was a strange sight, but it shouldn't have been one that inspired blind terror. But it did. James could sense that something was very wrong. He dived back into bed and pulled the sheets over his head. He lay there for a while, with his heart beating, and some time later, not long, maybe five minutes, he crept back to the window. The bus was outside his house. When he inched the curtains open, the horn went beep-beep. A friendly beep. A come on, it's time to go beep. James went back to bed, and this time he stayed there. The horn honked a few more times. A few minutes later, he heard the bus pull away. On Wednesday morning, when I saw him in school, James had black bags under bloodshot eyes. He claimed he hadn't slept a wink. He was clearly distressed. I made a mistake, he kept telling me. I shouldn't have looked, he kept saying. It doesn't mean anything, I told him. It's just a bus. But nothing I said seemed to reassure him. I shouldn't have looked, I shouldn't have looked, he kept saying. And that's where my story ends. Me and James went our separate ways at the end of the school day, and I never saw him again. That's it. No big reveal, no explanation, no twist, no climax, nothing. Unfortunately, life is like that. Loose ends and unanswered questions. I'm in my fifties now. Sometimes I get nightmares. Sometimes they're the same, and sometimes they're different, but even when they're different, they're just variations on a theme. Here's one. It's late at night. My car has blown a tire. I'm fixing it by the side of the road. I hear an engine. It gets closer and closer until I'm shielding my eyes from the glare of oncoming headlights. A school bus rolls by. As it passes me, I see a kid in the back window, banging the glass and screaming something that's lost in the roar of the GMC's huge diesel engine. It's James. He hasn't aged a day. I'm not a superstitious man. There's nothing in this story that can't be explained rationally. Maybe the bus has nothing to do with James's disappearance. Hell, maybe there was no bus. Maybe he dreamt the whole thing. Even so, I've got two children of my own. And when they were young, I told them an embellished version of this story story about an old school bus that cruises the streets at night. It moves slowly, like a stalking cat, its horn honking gently, a siren song to curious children. And if any children get out of bed, go over to the window and look outside, the bus will roll to a stop. The next time they look out of the window, it will be parked outside their house. Soon after that, maybe even the same night, that child will disappear without a trace. I told them that sometimes you can see the bus during the day, but during the day it can't hurt you. 
During the day, it just travels from town to town. Sometimes adults see it, too. It can't hurt adults. Or maybe it can. It just doesn't want them. Mostly, adults don't even notice it, but when they do, they certainly don't notice anything strange about it. Because although you can see through the windows, you can't see inside the bus. You can't see the children banging on the glass, crying and screaming and wondering why the hell you're just standing there looking at them and why the hell you don't do something. You can't see the children who gave up hope long ago and now just sit there, staring into space or sobbing into their laps. The children never get old. The bus never stops. My children cried and wouldn't sleep for a week. My wife was livid. I didn't care. I'm not saying that what I told my children is true. It's a bastardized version of what James told me with gaps filled in by my nightmares. Nevertheless, it seemed important to me that my children know that if they are ever lying in bed, and if they ever hear the sound of an engine and a honking horn, they ignore it. Failing that, they should run out of their rooms and come climb into bed with me and their mother. Anything. Just don't go to the window. I must say, the local school district should really look into detailing their fleet. Their buses are looking positively horrific. <laughs> ah. Now, for our final tale, it's definitely a good one for the campfire. You see... In the small town of Fairdale that rests on the edge of a forest, people have occasionally turned up horrifically mangled, hanging from the trees by barbed wire. So it's no wonder that the Fairdale kids stay inside. The Fairdale Kids Stay Inside by Kay Brown We called them fallen angels. They were strung up by their ankles and suspended from trees. There was always barbed wire wrapped all around the body, sliced the skin and ripped the tissue, and it was worse if they struggled. Ideally, they would die of dehydration, but this mercy was extended to only a very fortunate few. Most of the time, they would dangle from the branches for hours as the barbs tore their flesh and the pressure built in their heads. When upright, the heart doesn't have to pump blood that hard to circulate through the brain. Gravity does most of the work to get it back down. Consequently, the blood vessels up there are smaller and thinner than in the rest of the body. I'd rather be hung, personally. I'd much prefer the struggling for breath and kicking the air and the white-hot agony of my vertebrae coming apart than waiting for the blood to pool in my head, clot, and eventually burst the veins and feel the warm, sticky liquid drip out of my eyes, nose, mouth, and ears. A noose would be a kinder and suffocation gentler. 
There's something in there. My brother would tell me from the porch, pointing his cigarette toward the trees. It watches people, then strings up the ones it doesn't like. As paranoid as he was, I agreed with him. He spent a lot of time on that porch. I don't let him smoke in the house. He sat out there, cigarette in one hand, gun in the other, just watching the woods and waiting for something to come out. One night, I heard him yelling, frantically trying to get my attention. Gunshot after gunshot exploded through the air and intermingled with his crazed screaming. I ran out onto the porch to find my brother in a panic that was slowly turning to rage. Guns don't do shit! I saw them, their eyes just peering out from the trees, fucking watching me. They almost glowed. He emphatically pointed to the woods behind our house, trying to show me the eyes that weren't there. There's no reason to wake up the whole neighborhood. My brother had this habit of keeping his cigarette between his teeth when he talked. It didn't matter how important what he said was. I could only see the glowing end of the cigarette bobbing up and down as the words fell out. It was fucking infuriating. It was one of those trivial things that finds its way under your skin and stays there, tapping at the inside of your skull. I had expressed my displeasure several times, but he didn't seem to care much. I must have been giving him a look this time because he yanked the cigarette out of his mouth and let it simply dangle in his fingers. I will not be strung up in those woods. He spit his final words at me before stomping out his remaining half-cigarette and storming inside. I wasn't worried that the neighbors would call the police. They knew my brother, and they knew the woods. It was amazing the things you could get away with in this town. Everybody here was afraid, but more than that... They were constantly on edge, as if their whole body seethed with anticipation. The paranoia that was so ingrained into these people could only be born out of desperation. It seemed that they had tried everything. Guns, knives, brute force, shit. One time somebody tried to light the whole forest on fire. The kids played in the street or preferably if they had friends from the next subdivision in the backyards the next neighborhood over. When they grabbed their flashlights in the middle of the night, they would tell stories about the woods. They never talked about Bloody Mary or Slender Man, because in Fairdale, the real horror lived ten feet behind their homes. I don't think anyone in that town had seen the creatures in the woods, but we all knew what they looked like. The descriptions were spread in passing whispers and hushed voices, out of fear that they were listening. All the children spoke softly, but emphatically about their gray skin, six-inch fingers, and hollow, infinite sockets carved deep into their skull. They seemed almost human. Maybe they once were. Once, that I can remember, a kid went into the forest. A bunch of others dared him to. They waited in the shadows between houses, hearts pounding even though they weren't the ones going in. In silence, they watched him glance back, hoping they would call the whole thing off, and reluctantly submerged himself into the trees. There was the snapping of twigs, and then, abruptly, stillness. The group did not take their eyes off the woods, yet they could see the fear among their friends. They waited for a minute, surprisingly, 
before cautiously taking a few steps backward, then turning and sprinting away. The boy was gone. The very next day, a group of police officers, most of whom resigned that same day, were sent in after him. Let me tell you, he struggled. The wire tore through the skin of his abdomen, leaving his internal organs to spill out and hang from his body. After that day, no children went into the woods. They didn't even have to be told not to. After the paper ran that story, Fairdale lost its mind. Sure, bodies turned up every other week, but it was never a child. That kind of death was somehow more than murder. It was a disaster, a tragedy. I lived right on the edge of the woods, and that incident stuck with me. It somehow made the whole thing real. These things were here, right behind my house. My last night in Fairdale was hopefully the worst of my life. My brother was outside smoking and I was on the couch, mostly asleep. I'm not a heavy sleeper, so I was glad when the small noises around me seemed to quiet down. But just as I was about to drift off, my brother fired that goddamn gun about 3,000 times, ran inside, and slammed the door behind him. His fucking cigarette still lit, clamped fiercely between his teeth. I shot up, dazed and unsure of what was happening. Hands trembling, my brother ran to all the doors and windows, making sure they were locked. What the fuck, man? I rubbed my eyes, wishing I was sleeping. He sat on the coffee table, inches away from me his voice raspy and frightened. I saw them. They came out. His eyes were crazed, as his mouth was running faster than his head. He inadvertently blew smoke from his lips with every rushed word and forced breath. I didn't even know you could see them. My mouth opened, but before I could speak, I heard something tapping on the sliding glass door. My jaw hung ajar, and my brother and I froze instinctively. It was too soft to be a knock, but too hard to be the wind. A moment later, it came again. They're coming to get me, my brother whispered. His eyes were wild, darting across the room as if he was afraid to leave them in one place for too long. They don't like me. You sure you saw them? My voice was barely audible. Somehow I knew that they could hear me anyway. I first noticed them in the corner of my eye. Just one at first, but more came. Tap. 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 Tall. My god, they were tall. Until they started moving. I thought they were trees. Their arms hang at their sides and, and are as gangly as branches. What gave them away was the skin. Looked just like ash. Tap. 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 While the sounds did not increase in volume, they came to new places. I heard them still from the door, but now they were also at the windows, sides of the house, and most disturbingly, the roof. They don't have faces. I mean, they've got eyes, but not really. They've just got these holes. My brother made circles with his pointer finger and thumb and held them up over his own eyes. 
and the holes have this black shit coming out of them, just dripping down their heads. I... I think they could have been human, if they wanted to be. Tap. 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 My palms were clammy, and I broke out in a cold sweat. I could picture their long, bony fingers rapping on the house, their not eyes inches from the window waiting for us to draw back the curtain and meet their gaze. Until that moment, I don't think I have ever been truly afraid. Tap, tap, tap. It echoed all around us. We knew we couldn't leave. And even if we called someone, what good would it do? I don't think anything could save us. Our only option was to wait and hope that we had not received a death sentence. Tap, tap, tap. I now could hear it coming from beneath the house. These things were everywhere. It scared me that they didn't just burst in. That they were waiting for something, and it scared me more that I didn't know what. I couldn't do anything but wait. This isn't how I wanted to die. My brother and I sat on the floor between the couch and coffee table and hoped it would end. What do you think they are? I asked. We had heard all the stories, but these creatures had no name. They simply existed. They were always here, and we did everything we could to leave them alone, to live without them, and for the most part, they let us. They took some people, I suppose, to make an example. It was a constant reminder of the fear, and maybe it kept this town in line. My brother's head was bowed, and his eyes would not meet mine. He lit his fourth cigarette of the night, taking a long drag and holding it deep in his lungs before releasing it. With his eyes still fixed at the floor, he said the only words that have ever struck real fear into my core. Jimmy, I think they're God. I could only hear the tapping and feel them staring into me from all directions. Despite the emptiness of the house, we knew that they were in some way both inside and outside. I forced my eyes shut, and in the darkness I was only able to picture their elongated limbs hanging at their sides, their shoulders hunched to fit under our low ceilings. God, I could feel the inky ooze dripping onto my hair. I refused to open my eyes because if I did, they might have been there. If they remained closed, it was easier to pretend. Tap, tap, tap. My brother promised me that he would stay awake all night. He swore, grabbing a pillow from the couch, he handed it to me and insisted that I sleep. I argued, but I was so tired. Eventually, I did fall asleep, albeit against my will. Tap. 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 It had to be noon when I awoke. I was alone. I checked the whole house and even mustered up the nerve to step onto the porch, but I was alone. Dead or alive, I had to find my brother. I went into the woods. I think that was the biggest fuck-up of my entire life. After a deep breath, I stepped into the tree line. The sun was high in the afternoon sky, 
but it was impossibly dark inside that forest, and even more unbelievably silent. I was the only thing that disturbed the stillness. I'll be honest here and say that I didn't have a plan. I had no idea where to look for my brother. And I didn't know how I would react if I found him in the branches. When I stopped in a small clearing to look around, the blurs at the corner of my vision began to move. I knew what it was. I froze. I think that even my heart stopped beating. Maybe they wouldn't see me. Maybe they'd leave. Maybe I was losing my mind. They got closer to me. Close enough to see. If they didn't move, they could be the trees. But if they did, they were something that shouldn't have been allowed to exist. I shut my eyes and ran blindly through the forest, running into trees and scraping my arms on low-hanging branches. Miraculously, I made it out. I didn't stop running until I threw myself in my car. I sped down the highway and checked into a motel. Though it took me an extra hour to fall asleep that night, I kept the TV turned up just in case they came tapping. I never saw my brother or Fairdale again. I'm no genius, but I knew when to get the fuck out of that town. I moved to a new state, this time making sure I lived in the city, away from the woods. Even though years and miles have passed since that night, every so often I hear the tapping again, with the knowledge that I can never escape my hometown, I am left with nothing else to do but wait until it is my turn, and hope I dehydrate. Wow, that got dark. I really think he's worrying too much about his brother. I'm sure he's just hanging around somewhere. <laughs> ah, but still, I suppose I could be merciful and leave things on a lighter note. So here's a short one from a true beast's perspective. One with a vendetta against you. Such a strong grudge that you better listen when it tells you that you, you will pay. You will pay. By Sienna. I am your worst nightmare. I know others claim to be, but they're wrong. When you realize I'm out there, your knees go weak. You see my name, your mouth goes dry. You see a shadow, you know it's me. You know I'm there. Your heart races. You walk down the street after a long day at work. It's very cold out, and everyone has already retired to their warm houses, snuggled up by loved ones. But not you. Now you regret volunteering for overtime. You know I'm walking behind you, just far enough so I can see you 
but not vice versa. I have been planning, waiting, observing. You cross the street in a feeble attempt to escape me. <laughs> that won't work. And deep down inside, you know that too. You rush home, hoping that when you get inside your house, I'll disappear. You break out into a sprint, feet hitting the hard pavement. I run after. We're locked in a chase. Will I catch up, or will you escape? You practically throw yourself against the door. Breathing heavily, you fumble with the lock. You get in and slam the door so hard that the burnt-out light bulb in the kitchen regains power. You slump against the door, safe. Safe until tomorrow. For I will get you, Mr. Mailman. I will get you. Dog. Dog. Dogs. Blah. Am I right? Oh, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I like our canine friends just fine. I just happen to be more of a cat person myself. <laughs> uh, well, alas, my friend, that time has come. I do believe my stories are done. The fire shall keep the darkness at bay. So sleep, and you should see the next day. <laughs> Good night, kitties. Pleasant dreams. The Mad Catter Presents Twisted Tea Time is copyright 2016 by Z.P. Gowdy. All stories are the properties of their respective authors and are obtained via direct permission, creative commons, or their simply public domain. Twisted Tea Time is executively produced for RenegadeRadio.com by Charlie Renegade. And you can listen to Twisted Tea Time on RenegadeRadio.com Saturday nights at 9 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Support Twisted Tea Time by subscribing to us on Patreon at patreon.com slash themadcatter. Music for Twisted Tea Time is used courtesy of Kevin McLeod at incompetech.com, as well as Jason White, whose work can be found at soundcloud.com slash angels of dash despair. Details can be found in the show notes. If you want more of me and my mischief, find my charming grin on facebook.com slash Cheshire Hat or on Twitter at RealMadCatter. Download past episodes from SoundCloud at soundcloud.com slash Cheshire Hat or visit me at www.themadcatter.net. Good night, kitties. Pleasant dreams. Ha, 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 ha.